And what they try to do through these kind of agreements is to tie the hands of governments so that they can't in the future reinsert those priorities into the ways that governments operate. So basically cementing in the neoliberal model for time immemorial to the benefit of big corporations and big states and disempowering almost all of us. So if you think about the classic 99% 1%, this is an agreement for the 1%, or probably actually an agreement for the 0.1%. The proposal to have this particular agreement that involves 12 countries now dates back to the George W, uh, sorry, the George Bush Jr. Um, era. And there had been since 2000 a whole lot of agreements between different countries that had been stitched up and gradually those countries were overlapping and the proposal, uh, Alton Grosser claims it is his brainchild, uh, was to put them all together, to create a patchwork quilt <coughs> that could achieve from below what they had tried to do in the World Trade Organization. Remember back the collapse of the Seattle ministerial meeting and so on, they weren't able to stitch up a global set of rules, so they thought they could put them together through like-minded players from <coughs> below. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement um, initially was seen as um, the US basically, supposedly joining, but basically taking over and redrawing a negotiation between New Zealand, Singapore, Chile, Brunei, and the US on financial services and investment. Ironically, at just the time that the financial crisis was happening, so they wanted to develop rules that were going to make it even better for the banks uh, at a time when it was all falling apart. But let's just leave logic aside for the moment. The um, Australians and a uh, couple of other countries said, oh, okay, well, we're in two. Now, this looks like a jolly good idea. And Obama got elected, decided mm, uh, maybe I you know, was elected on a platform that said these kind of agreements weren't very good. Um, oh, what the heck, let's do it. And so they, about four and a half years ago, started negotiating this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which they branded as an agreement for the 21st century. And what was going to be unique about it was that it was going to go further, this is their words, further behind the border in putting disciplines on governments than any previous agreement had done. So it's not about trade itself in the old-fashioned sense. It's about changing the rules so that they, across a whole range of countries, work best for the big corporations, especially the big US corporations, ranging from the drug companies and the banks through to Hollywood and the big courier firms or the environment um, uh, and mining companies and so on. And so this is actually about regulatory sovereignty. It's about the right of governments to decide what the balance and mix now and in the future should be in the interests of their people. And we keep saying an agreement for the 21st century is not a neoliberal agreement. That's an agreement that belongs in the 20th century and failed. The 21st century is going to be full of all sorts of challenges, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, financial instability, whether it's the rampant inequalities within countries or between countries, whether it's um, social instabilities. There's going to be all sorts of challenges. The last thing we need is to have cement poured around the feet of governments in responding to those and ensuring that the interests of the corporations come first. Now, that battle we've been fighting for <coughs> four and a half years. And more recently, the 
they have designed two new of these mega agreements that we have to see as an unholy um, boyka. There is a similar kind of agreement now being negotiated between the US and the EU, the two big elephants in the Western sphere. And that one is going to be stitched up to serve the interests of the transatlantic corporate lobbies. The third one, some of you may remember that we had a campaign in the early 2000s around something called the GATS, which is an agreement that the big services companies want to get to lock governments into rules that work for those services companies. Now, they haven't been able to achieve that in the World Trade Organization, so they've now set up their own side negotiation with 22 parties, including the US and the EU and New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they call themselves the really good friends of services. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So you've actually got three mega deals that they're looking at to form the straitjacket around our governments for the future. They're all being negotiated in secret. They uh, are all being influenced heavily by the major corporate lobbies and none of them are in our interest. So, we have been, as, as a lot of people in Christchurch have been, uh, raising issues around the need to know what is happening in these negotiations. At present, all we really know is what has happened from the leaks or what's happened from those of us who have been on the ground monitoring uh, the negotiations uh, and then, of course, the reassurances from our government that we have nothing to worry about because we can trust them to act in the national interest. The secrecy in these negotiations goes beyond any that we've had before. Not only have they said they won't release the text until the negotiations are concluded and it's signed, but all of the background documents will be kept secret for four years beyond when the agreement comes into force, so we won't be able to see what our government actually put on the table and hold them to account because by that time, of course, they won't be the government. Even though Trump's rules might be believed this week. <laughs> <laughs> the secrecy in the services negotiations is even more. The documents will be kept secret for five years uh, beyond the agreement coming into force. Now, you have to ask why they're doing this. And they say, oh, that's because you can't negotiate these things in public. Well, of course negotiate these things in public. That's what a democracy is about. Imagine if in Parliament we had the Cabinet saying, oh, sorry, we can't let you see a statute until it's um, in force because you might like it and it might not happen. Uh, that's actually what will happen with this agreement. It, the mandate comes from the Cabinet. It is negotiated by officials who are accountable to the Cabinet. It is signed on the authority of the Cabinet and it is ratified or comes into force on the authority and decision of the cabinet. The parliament gets to see it once it's, the negotiations are over and effectively you can't change it. The select committee gets to hear submissions, but the select committee and the parliament can't actually change any content of the agreement. That is about as much of a contempt for democratic process as you can find. So why should we be concerned uh, about this? Well, I'm sure that Eric has talked to you uh, about the medicines issues and the medical community has really been out there challenging what the implications of this will be for affordable medicines, but also for a whole range of other health-related concerns. You've also heard about the impacts on internet freedom, uh, and in fact, one of the things 
that we're going to be doing some more about uh, shortly is the implications for privacy and the implications for national security monitoring um, of data held because there will be a rule we believe now in this agreement that will say that you cannot require data to be held within the country here. So our data can be stored off in servers and processed and whatever in other countries, especially the US, which has no privacy protections and which is subject to extensive national security laws for accessing data. So we have all sorts of implications in both the um, intellectual property and e-commerce chapters. There's 29 chapters in this agreement. About five of them are concerned with old-fashioned trade, but others of them are concerned <laughs> with what kind of rules we're allowed to adopt. For example, there's a completely novel chapter on state-owned enterprises, which, as far as I can tell from being in Sydney last Monday and Tuesday, may in fact fetter our ability to set up a new state-owned enterprise, as several of the opposition parties have suggested, for example, for insurance. <laughs> there are other chapters uh, about what kind of rules our government can have. The e-commerce one uh, and in relation to data holding is, is another that um, I just mentioned. We, we also have rules in there that are about what the processes of lawmaking have to be. And those processes will include requirements that proposed new laws are put out there for comment. And that's good in a democracy. We want that. But those who are guaranteed the right to comment aren't going to be our local citizens. They are going to be the commercial interests of the other parties who have a guaranteed right to express their views about proposed new laws and regulations by our government and rights to demand that their proposals are taken seriously and that they can be the explanations why they're not adopted and so on. That, ironically, is in a chapter called Transparency. <laughs> <laughs> so it's transparency for the big corporations, not the transparency of these negotiations for us. Um, there is another chapter on regulatory coherence which uh, aims, along with other parts of the agreement, to require governments, if they're looking at a policy or regulation, to adopt the one that has the least intrusive impacts on commercial interests. Think Pike River. Think forestry, health and safety, and felling laws. Think leaky buildings. Think um, finance company collapse. Light-handed, risk-tolerant regulation. We know it hasn't worked, but there will be a presumption that governments opt for that kind of regulation as opposed to heavy-handed, intrusive regulation, which many of us think now is needed. The area that has uh, generated the most controversy, aside from medicines, has been the investment chapter. Now, part of that chapter is about providing more watertight guarantees for foreign investors to be able to come and invest. That there won't be preferences for um, local uh, interests, local investors, local companies. Even in the case of uh, procurement contracts, local providers of goods and services ahead of the interests of a foreign investor who may be established here. So foreign investors are guaranteed to have at least as good treatment as New Zealanders are and thresholds of high, high thresholds at which their entry would be vetted, locked in and every time we raise them, the new one gets locked in. But Whilst they are guaranteed to get at least as good access and treatment as locals, foreign investors actually get special rights over and above locals. And 
there are two rules in these agreements. One of them uh, is around indirect expropriation, that is, if the government introduces new regulations or policies or takes actions that seriously erode the value of an investment, taking part of that value of that investment away, then the government can be sued directly by the foreign investor for compensation. The second is a similar rule, but it's one that's become more really popular because there have been a few constraints put around that first one. And the double speak in these things is, is just extraordinary, but this rule guarantees foreign investors fair and equitable treatment. Now, fair and equitable treatment for the foreign investor is that the rules don't change on the foreign investor after the investment has been made in a way that might have a significant impact on their value or their profitability. Now think about all of those areas in which we've had foreign investors who've come in when there are virtually no regulations at all that apply to them. And we think, actually, in the public interest, we need to stop them rorting us and we need actually to put some regulations around. And I'm sure in Christchurch you can think of many examples. The fair and equitable treatment rule <coughs> and the expropriation rule both allow the foreign investor to sue the New Zealand government directly, not through its parent state, but directly, in offshore tribunals that operate largely in secret. They're not like ordinary courts. Right? When we go to our courts, we know that they're open. We know that there are certain rules that apply we call it, as, as lawyers, a system of precedent. Yeah? That like cases are treated alike. And there's rules that bind the judges when they're making these decisions. And we know as well that there's a system of appeals. And we know that the judges are actually required, they're permanent, they're full time, they're required only to be judges. <laughs> Well, none of that applies in these investment tribunals. They operate um, largely in secret. In fact, in a number of cases, we don't even know if there is a dispute happening. Uh, there will be a little bit more openness, we believe, uh, because of a fuss that's been made about this in the TPPA context, and, and there was some disagreement about that in the leaked investment chapter. But they may release some of the documents, but it's not going to be open court. The judges in these investment tribunals are actually lawyers who take the cases for foreign investors and then act as judges and then go back and act as lawyers for foreign investors for a no effect conflict of interest rules. They don't have any system of rules that apply to them in terms of precedence. They sit on an ad hoc basis. They make up the rules. They choose whether they're going to take any notice of an earlier ruling by someone else or not. They're totally unpredictable. And often they go off on their own little flights of fancy. There is no system of appeal. There are some kind of backdoor ways that you can seek an annulment, but there is no system of appeals. They are notorious for being pro-investor. They not only make very large awards, but they make awards for lost future profits. They make awards for interest that is compounded back to the date when the action of the government was taken. The costs of simply defending a case, the OECD puts at an average of $8 million. 
but which in uh, one case that we've been monitoring, the Philippines is now over $50 million on a corrupt contract for building a, an airport PPP. And the consequence of this is that not only do you worry about what happens in a dispute, but the threat of a dispute is what gets governments to back off an action that the investor doesn't want the government to take. It's what we call the chilling effect. So if you think what I said earlier about the transparency chapter and so on, right, the investor, the foreign investor, might input when we're thinking about what new laws and things we might do, and if nevertheless we decide to proceed with them, then it'll threaten to sue us, and if we don't back off, then it will actually sue us. Now what's happening uh, in, in most recent times is that um, the mega law firms and some of the private equities are actually chasing these cases, approaching companies to say, let us bring you a case and we'll basically lease the case from you, run it for you and give you a share of what we want to get. So it's become a business in itself. And it's toxic. Toxic to the point that, at a meeting I was at at UNCTAD in Geneva about a week ago, a whole series of governments got up and explained why they are now withdrawing from these agreements that have these powers. South Africa, India, Namibia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, Indonesia, Right? Because they're all getting screwed. How might it operate with us? Well, let's just, and I only want to give a couple of examples because I'm aware of the time, but plain packaging tobacco. Most people have followed what's been happening with the tobacco policies. Yeah? We have a commitment to smoke free 2025. Actually, thanks to the Māori Party, when Mone Haruero was in there in Kalyana Turia, and they um, ran this inquiry in the Māori Fair Select Committee. And, of course, the tobacco companies are beside themselves, not because they care about New Zealand, but because they care about precedents that other countries might follow. And we know that Australia has pursued the plain packaging law. And Australia got the same threats from the tobacco companies. And Australia said, well, I'm sorry, but public health is actually more important. And so they proceeded with and have implemented the plain packaging law. They are now being sued. Being sued by Philip Morris through one of these investment agreements in secret proceedings that are taking place in Singapore for over a billion dollars. They're also being sued in the World Trade Organization by a number of countries such as Ukraine and Dominican Republic and so on, which the tobacco companies are actually funding. But the important thing is that Australia has said, we will defend this. The New Zealand government introduced the plain packaging law. It went to the select committee. There was huge support for it. The tobacco companies threatened to bring uh, a dispute, and the tobacco companies have for now won. That was not reported back from Select Committee before the election, and the national government has said, we will not implement this law until all of the cases against Australia are over, which is likely to be about eight years, and simply if Australia loses, New Zealand won't proceed. Now, that shows how aggressively these things can be used. But one of the things that we have, and, and Tim Grosser and others say, oh, so there's no problem. We've already got some of these agreements. So, you know, another one's not going to make any difference. Well, I'm sorry, it is going to make a difference. This is the US we're talking about. The US is hugely litigious. The US and the EU have between them all two-thirds of these investment disputes. And the graph that shows these disputes over the last 12 years goes like that. So the number of disputes now is growing enormously. Examples of cases that are currently underway, aside from, say, the tobacco ones, 
Quebec is being, the Canadian government is being sued for $500 million for a moratorium on fracking that Quebec has introduced. The um, Canadians are also being sued by a US drug company, Eli Lilly, for a decision of the Canadian Supreme Court that denied Eli Lilly a renewal of a patent by applying Canadian law. The Ecuador government is being sued by Chevron to overturn a decision in the Chevron court, in the Ecuador court, which Chevron asked to be heard in those courts about cleaning up the Amazon. And Chevron is chucked now the decision of the court that it said it wanted to go to and then a provincial process. We have in India being challenged. We have in Germany Vattenfall, which is a Swedish company, challenging the closure of the nuclear power plant near the Fukushima disaster. Now, these are all the things that your sound a little bit at the moment. Uh, it's just okay. cutting in and out a little bit. So, um, can we cut through and see if it works to the what can we do? Okay, I'm just I'm just going on to that now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, we are now at the stage in these negotiations where almost all of the technical stuff is over. We're down to the political decision making. Where they are going to decide the trade-offs about which of the policies and areas that affect us they're going to concede, and by they I mean um, Tim Grocer and John Key, and what they're going to claim to get in return. Now, each of the 12 countries, Canada, US, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam and Japan, each of them will sit down and work out what their trade-offs are going to be. But that is all on hold for now because the two elephants in the room, Japan and the US, are locked in an old-fashioned trade battle about agriculture and automobiles. And God bless them, that could go on forever. <laughs> However, it could also get resolved by a pragmatic political compromise in the next month or two. If that happens, then the political horse trading is going to begin. Now what Tim Grosser has said is that unless New Zealand gets extensive access to Japan and the US for dairy, i.e. Fonterra, it will not enter into this deal. However, I don't believe he will play hardball for as long as he can, but what we think is going to happen, and what his statements in the last couple of days suggest he thinks will happen as well, is that the US and Japan will do a duty deal between themselves, and then they'll say, okay, all the rest of you, this is what's on the table for you, take it or leave it. And there will be virtually nothing in there for the areas of dairy that New Zealand wants. Now, even if you thought it was acceptable to trade off tons of butter for our future, we're not going to get tons of butter. But you can guarantee that Tim Grosser is still going to want to argue it's more important that we're at the table because this is a mega deal and if we're not there, we're isolated and so he will make the trade-offs. And that's why we now have to start putting the pressure on the government 
and from all of the opposition parties, including Labour. The, um, unfortunately, um, some things we fear that we thought were off the table are coming back on. Um, so, you know, we play this constant game of trying to work out what's there. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, the Minister will say when the agreement comes out, if it ever does. Um, you see there was a lot of scaremongering and some of these things that were said aren't there. Well, um, we know why they're not there and we need to make it clear that this is because of the pressure that was brought to bear on them, not because they were such enlightened uh, negotiators operating in the national interest. <laughs> What would you say to those who are afraid of New Zealand not being at the table and the future of New Zealand international trade? We have nothing to gain from this agreement. I mean, that's what I'd say. We have, even, even when um, they were claiming that it would be comprehensive liberalisation of all of the agricultural markets across all these 12 countries, most of us most of the 12 already have agreements amongst each other. Huh? And so really for New Zealand on, on agriculture, it was Japan, um, the US and Canada. None of them are putting anything significant forward. Last weekend, Japan made an offer to New Zealand, which I understand was basically what we already have from Japan and the World Trade Organization. Um, and that's part of the reason why the minister so panicked. The problem is that we're not going to see the shape of the deal until it's signed. So the ability to say that cost-benefit analysis doesn't weigh up is going to come too late. And that's a major problem. Um, the Australian uh, Productivity Commission, which is a, hardly a um, socially progressive body, did an interesting report um, oh, about three years ago now on the free trade agreements that Australia had entered into. And it was scathing about the Australian US FTA. Uh, and it said that the costs outweighed the benefits um, to Australia from that deal. Uh, one of our um, dilemmas as negotiators in New Zealand um, in negotiating these deals is that we've already given everything away. And we've taken all our tariffs away. We've got virtually no restrictions on foreign investment. We've got very light regulation. Um, all of our services markets are highly liberalised. We, we have very few restrictions on anything. So we have few bargaining chips to say that we'll open this up for you if you give us that. And that's what the Canadians are saying whenever I talk to them. What, yeah, why should we do a deal with New Zealand? What, 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 what benefit's going to be for us? So yeah, the, even if you look at it in a hard-nosed negotiating sense, there ain't no gains there for us. I'm just uh, wondering in a practical sense, um, so Supposing a transnational corporation did win a decision from the, the Business State Tribunal, um, I'm just wondering how that is enforceable in reality. Um, what if Australia or Canada said, well, good luck to you, but we ain't paying? Yeah, yeah. Argentina's got that problem at the moment. Um, <coughs> remember the big financial crisis in Argentina? Um, there were a whole lot of water privatisations and electricity privatisations that were basically PPP contracts there that had the payments in the Argentine peso that was convertible to the US dollar and when Argentina devalued, of course, the returns they got were much less and so there have been big cases on that. There's also been cases on Argentina's bonds which were pretty worthless, they were marked down, and the vulture funds came in and bought them, then demanded to be paid back at face value with the bonds. Now, um, <coughs> the victories against Argentina on, on a 
majority of the cases Argentina has um, has so far faced. It's got a massive number. It's got about sixty billion dollars worth of cases against it at present. Um, but there have been attempts to get enforcement of those through the U.S. courts, including the attachment of Argentine government assets in the U.S. And indeed, there was an attempt to seize a Ghana ship in, uh, sorry, a, an Argentine ship in, a, in the port of Ghana um, to pay for some of these um, damages. So there are various ways that they have for it. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I think we all sort of feel very much that you're preaching to the converted. We, we sort of feel like you. Is there any chance that you can actually give this lecture to caucus? That there's some way that you can organize for them to be <laughs> preached there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you see the little flock of flying pigs go past the <laughs> with members of, of, um, of the caucus, uh, but one of the problems uh, here is that they've all been instructed um, that even the ministers responsible for various relevant portfolios, any inquiries are referred to Tim Grosser. Uh, recently, the, the doctors did manage to get a response to their letter out from the health minister. Uh, but it was basically scripted by MFAP, and um, that's what they replied to yesterday in the open letter that uh, came out from a number of medical groups, also in the New Zealand Doctor and in the Herald yesterday in an op-ed. Um, there are, are many attempts to have chats with members of the national government, but it's kind of a lost by known people. Unknown people? Go see Jerry Brown. Well, <laughs> maybe someone who's a little bit more valuable. Um, but you'll find that they actually don't know the, the level of ignorance. But it's also really important the, the uh, Labour Caucus. Because Phil Goff, David Shearer, um, Clayton Cosgrove, um, Chris Hipkins, they are all supportive of the agreement. And um, there is a Labour Party resolution that says um, they will not support the agreement unless the following. Uh, and they are viewing that as a kind of malleable list, um, but um, Phil Goff did ask a question in the House yesterday of Tim Grosser, and he uh, not only attacked the fact that there won't be anything for agriculture, but he did raise a number of the other issues on the list, um, uh, including Farmac and tobacco, and um, but the part of the problem with Labour is that these negotiations were actually launched under Phil Goff. Yeah. And they brought in a whole pile of free trade agreements during the 2000s. Now, they, they are accepting that this agreement is much bigger and more intrusive and more risky than those ones. But you've got some real die-hard Roger Known free traders who are still there um, who really don't want to come out against these. And it will be worth if you have any of the potential leaders going to be down in Christchurch, those of you who are Labour Party people, go and ask them what their position is on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. When it's signed, can we get out of it? Um, in theory, yes. In theory, there will be a provision that will allow New Zealand to withdraw. In practice, no. Um, I'm not aware 
of any government that has withdrawn from an agreement of this kind. The one I mean, ones I mentioned before in terms of investment are specific investment agreements and there are little windows that governments are using there. These kind of big agreements, um, just think of what the reaction would be of threats of investor flight, investor strike, credit rating downgrades, what it would do to our reputation in the international community. Uh, we view ourselves as exemplary citizens of the World Trade Organization. If we do this, then other countries will think it's a green light to do this. And for all of those reasons, you won't find a government um, that is against from such an agreement, even though notionally it's possible. That's what we've got to stop at first. Yep. Yes, we agree. Um, look, I know you don't get the opportunity to ask Jane Kelsey a question every day, um, but I am sorry, I am, I'm very kind of aware of the time at the moment, so we will have to leave it there. Jane, it's been just extraordinary having you and being able to have this conversation, even though it is a bit weird. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to Beverly. She's graciously changed from first speaker to last speaker. Um, so um, Beverly's a, a woman to watch. Um, Beverly Valentine. She ran against um, uh, what's his name? Jerry yeah, Jerry Brownlee in Ireland. She was the internet money candidate, ranked tenth in the middle of doing her Masters of International Law and Politics. She already has an honours in sociology, so she's pretty clued up and um, she's going to talk to us about internet access and how that's going to be affected. When we think about how important the internet is today, it's, it's unquestionable. It's become a huge part of our lives. Um, a lot of our sociologists will talk about the digital age and the fact that the internet and um, everything that the internet age means for, for life today and for future generations is so important. When you think about all the things that you use the internet for, you can find a job, find a house, find your old friends, find your next partner, um, lol at cats, um, you know, whatever you want to do. The internet is a tool um, of information that has the possibility to empower people hugely and inform people hugely. And if you think of any question now, the information is at your fingertips within seconds. It's unprecedented rates of speed and knowledge and communication, freedom and convenience as well. So it's really, really important and it's not only a luxury. In the future it's going to be a necessity. It's going to be a tool that if you have it, you're, you're in the game. If you're not, you're out of it. It's so important to become digitally clued up, and so it's really important to look at how the TPPA is going to affect um, the internet and how some of our freedoms uh, will be affected. So um, the last few decades, as I've said, have seen quantum leaps forward in our technological development and our uh, capacity for communication. Um, we can just have a conversation with someone who's completely out of the area live and inform us and educate us and free up our minds and talk and discuss and have new ideas. Um, so, despite, as she mentioned, despite being a free trade agreement and labelled as a trade agreement, um, only about five of the sections of the TPPA actually address trade and the rest are what are referred to as, uh, as sort of uh, rent-seeking initiatives um, or protectionist regulations. Um, which are all really about um, profit uh, for, for the corporations who are lobbying for them. Um, so one very clear uh, example of this is the section that's going to be covering intellectual property enforcement, um, which is surreptitiously pushing a lot of the uh, ideas that were brought up in previous uh, agreements which have already been rejected, such as SOPA and PIPA, 
Um, and the, TB, the TPPA is kind of being used as a Trojan horse in order to push these through by um, touting these ideas of free trade as being so beneficial, um, but in reality we're making a whole lot of concessions in other areas in order to gain access to these benefits. Um, so there are many implications of the intellectual property enforcement section. Um, extending patents could allow large companies to develop their market monopolies even easier and lock out smaller startup corporations and competition. Um, it could increase the price of, the price of goods with uh, reduction of uh, competition as well um, and potentially even restrict your overall choice to what you're actually allowed to gain access to as your market competitors are squashed. Um, and it's easy to see how these models promoted within the TPPA are at odds with the freedom that we enjoy and the accessibility and universality of the internet um, that we currently have. Anyone can go online and gain information, anyone can write and share their story and anyone can learn. Um, so here are some of the alarm bells to sort of be aware of and switched on to when you're listening to discussions about the TPPA regarding internet freedom. Um, and I really just want to give you some questions to ask, um, rather I don't have the solutions, um, but I want you to think about it and try to clarify in your mind how you view the internet um, as a tool and how, you've, how you view um, information, um, whether it's something to be owned um, and bought or whether it's something to be shared for the greater good. Um, I know what side I fall, but I'm not going to try and push you towards that. I want you to sort of think for yourselves and discuss. Um, so the first red flag, obviously, which has been briefly kind of mentioned, is um, uh, stricter enforcement of copyright law uh, and of copyright breaches and a big push towards ISP, which is Internet Service Provider Responsibility. Now, um, from what I can see, there's, there's two main repercussions of this. The first one is that the Internet Service Providers will be forced to be content police. Um, so that basically means you're shifting the burden of responsibility of copyright breaches from the people who commit the copyright breach to the people who allegedly allow it to happen. Um, so it would be the same thing as um, uh, somebody writing it, uh, ripping off an article or printing it in a newspaper, you sue the newspaper rather than the person who wrote it or the person who downloaded it as well. Um, so bearing in mind that most, at current, most um, internet service providers and websites with file sharing capabilities already have it written into their terms and agreements of service that you must not upload or download copyrighted content. The user already has to agree to that in order to agree to have access to the service. Additionally to that, the internet service providers have many methods of taking down content that is seen to breach copyright laws. So you might have come across this already if you've tried to search a video on YouTube and you found that it's come up um, as blank, this, this content has been removed for um, copyright reasons. So this already exists, and yet the TPPA is pushing towards stronger and stricter and heavier and longer um, punishments towards internet service providers, um, in particular, putting the, the burden on their shoulders in order to enforce copyright laws. And it's understandable when you look at the companies who are behind um, the TPPA, or, or refuted to be at least because, again, it's so secretive, but we've got Comcast, we've got... Um, I've got a huge list here. We've got a, a big list of not only ca US cable providers, um, but we've also got Hollywood and the entertainment industry, which is getting behind it as well. So their main objective is protecting their own profits and squashing their competitors and giving you one choice that you have to buy, rather than allowing all these startup um, companies to get up there and share the internet and give you the choice that you can select anything you want to, whatever your reasons might be. Um, so. These questions of, uh, oh, so how are we, how are we going to police copyright, um, the, especially in the digital age, this is a big question, it's very complicated. Um, is the answer to remove service from people who breach it, or is it to give them a $100,000 fine and a prison term sentence? Um, again, I'm not going to give you the answers, these questions are really complex and they're very, very new and modern. Um, but they really highlight the need for um, discussion and keeping up to date with our laws in, order, in this new um, digital environment that we're facing. Um, so another um, implication of the focus on the ISPS is, is that it's a step closer to content censorship. Um, so one of the main benefits obviously of the internet, as I've said, is the freedom and flow of information and the accessibility um, and capacity for a more educated and aware populace. Um, when it's used for good. 
Um, some internet content is already censored for good reason, for example, child pornography. Um, however, we need to think very deeply about who gets to censor and for what reasons. Um, and keep these questions in mind when we're looking at who's driving these clauses within the TPPA, um, because they're wanting to control what, what is and isn't successful on the internet. So, is, um, we, we really need to consider and question what's, what's being protected and who's watching these watches. How do we know what is and isn't being censored? How can we uh, keep control over that? And how can we see what, what we're not allowed to be shown? Um, so it's unlikely that corporations are going to want um, activist websites and, and service providers which challenge these large companies to be very successful on the internet and, and to have huge pressures put on them to have their... Um, their uh, access to the internet within, within their terms of, um, sorry I've lost my place, in terms of their service that they get provided. So we can already see this within negotiations, for example, um, Netflix, they were in a trade dispute, um, their uh, download speeds shot down once they agreed to the um, terms and conditions of their trade agreement shot back up again. So we can see that they, they're not ethical, they do use um, restrictions of service in order to pressure um, websites and um, service providers into agreeing to their, their, their terms and conditions. So the ownership of information and the freedom and access of information are two kind of con contradictory ideas. So if you can think of a bookshop versus a public library, um, and, and how can we justly reward content providers while also valuing universal sharing of information and the benefits that that provides. So the TPPA solution is to protect the content providers and the private uh, organisations first and foremost, um, with stricter enforcement, heavier penalties and longer and stronger protections. Obviously this would enforce huge restrictions on who is allowed to view what and when, um, and once again with the control being in the hands of corporations. So. Consider how this might cause you advantages or disadvantages with issues such as content being released in some, uh, some countries early and being withheld for six months and others. So this might be slightly inconvenient when you want to see the next episode of your program, but it could be a huge, huge detriment if you're doing research and you don't have access to the latest data and technologies and information that's out there, um, or you're having to pay through the nose to get it. Um, so TPPA is also strongly advocating for something called DRM, or Digital Right Management Software, and in layman's terms this is basically locking tools. Um, so these prevent editing or changes made to both content and content devices um, under the assumption that this will be for copyright. Um, so this already exists to a certain extent, but it's promoted and strengthened under the TPPA. So a potential real-life implication of this, which you might have already experienced, is if you've bought a phone and it's locked to a single carrier and you have to pay more to unlock it for a different carrier or be forced to, fight to buy another device. So um, this is one way that the giants will use their, um, their uh, sovereignty, their monopoly over the market to force you into certain consumer choices. Um, and a, a broader way um, that this, this could be exemplified, hypothetically, say there's two game developers, there's Angry Birds and Flappy Birds, and Apple decides that they've got certain um, demands that the companies must adhere to, one of them agrees to them, one of them doesn't, well, one of the games is going to do a lot better than the other, and the other one will get locked out. Um, so, in another way that this is really important is in terms of accessibility. Um, the TPPA tracks, um, attacks any kind of translation of products, so whether it's for audio or visual disabilities, translation of texts, um, that could be seen as a breach of copyright. Um, so, we want to sort of ask, um, how do we balance our treatment of knowledge, and is, is, is knowledge something that should be shared for the greater good, or is it better to restrict access to certain groups? So, do copyright, does copyright um, enhance um, creativity by driving profit, um, or does it squash the competitors and draw an unlevel playing field? Um, to sum up, when the net is neutral, um, and when all data is treated equally, no matter where it came from or who created it, you've got the potential for these small startups and, and, and ordinary people to have huge success and overcome existing giants. So you only need to think of Facebook or uh, regular people who were discovered on YouTube or become famous successful bloggers and share their creativity. It's an open platform where people who have talent and creativity can share their knowledge and succeed. Um, and net neutrality is something really important that the TPPA wants to threaten. Again, by shifting the control over to these, these large corporations into what, what is successful and what, what isn't successful. 
Um, so the main point I really want you to take away with is to be aware of some of the possible potholes um, and to feel really confident in expressing your thoughts and opinions and values of what knowledge means to you um, because it is a contentious subject um, and what copyrights mean to you and, and please don't be put off, I assume most of you would have looked at the, the text passages that have been released by Wikileaks themselves, don't be put off by the technical jargon and the long language and things that are used, go ahead and have your opinion because these things are important and to misquote the, the words of John Oliver, if you want to get away with doing something evil, just put it inside something really difficult and boring. <laughs> um, so, what, what, what does the internet mean to you? And, and what's the value of the internet and the future of yourself and the future of humankind as a learning tool, as a, as a, a way to open our world and our, open our capacity for communication? Are we going far enough already to protect our content, uh, content providers? Or does the capitalistic mindset create an environment that's almost hostile to creativity? Um, how can we do things better? Because we have a chance now to, to really shape and start defining how our digital future is going to develop. Um, and that's about all I have to say, so thank you. <laughs>